second. Bruch Maboyan. Thank you very much for attending, and again, welcome to our home. The uh, lecture tonight, on my thought, and my thought this week will discuss the topic of kosher in Judaism. The Medrash Tanhuma states that before a baby is born, that God commands it from this, that which is kosher, you may eat, and from this, that which is not kosher, you may not eat. As it states in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Ayikra, at the end of the portion of Shemini, this is unclean to you, and this is clean. So once the baby in its mother's womb accepts all the mitzvot in the Torah, then it is ready to be born. So from this medrash, it would seem that eating kosher food is really the one mitzvah that is explained to the baby while it is still in its mother's womb. But, but the medrash states, accept all the mitzvot. So then it would seem that accepting all the mitzvot is, is dependent on keeping kosher. Since eating non-kosher food taints a person's mind and heart, which can cause them to forget their Torah learning and possibly fill their heart and mind with heretical thoughts. So without kosher food, it would be basically impossible to acquire and understand the wisdom of Torah. Rav Chaim Hassan's, a great rabbi that lived in the 18th century, 17, 18, 19th or 18th, he said that the entire Jewish communities had been virtually lost to the faith due to irresponsible and incompetent ritual slaughterers, Shechtim, as their unsuspecting clientele filled their stomachs with trephos, unkosher meat. Their minds were being influenced by foreign and heretical thoughts, and this brought about a gradual and subtle change in their religious practices and principles, until in the end, many were lost to the holy nation. There are various reasons given for the laws of Kashrus. The Rambam states in Moran Nevuchim that forbidden foods are harmful for the body, such as trichinosis, which was found in pigs. Rav Shimshu will follow her, states that a person is referred to as a migdash ma'at, which means a minor sanctuary. So just as the physical temple can be defiled, so too a person's own bodily temple can become defiled. The Akedus Yitzchak says that forbidden foods have the ability to cultivate evil traits in a person. And the Kliyokar states that forbidden foods form a, a coarseness and cruelty among all those who eat them. The effect of forbidden, forbidden foods is on our souls, which is a lack of spirituality. Rabbeinu Bachai states that the four distinct non-kosher animals that are mentioned in the portion of Shemini are listed in four separate verses. He says that they allude to the four different exiles that the Jewish nation would experience. The camel alludes to the Babylonian exile. The rock badger alludes to the Greek exile. The hare alludes to subjugation by Persia. And the pig alludes to the Roman exile. Now the fact that the pig does not chew its cud is an allusion to the fact that this is the last exile that we as a nation will experience. It will not be repeated. Now in the book of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy in the portion of Re'e, these same four non-kosher animals are, are repeated. However, there, there in the portion of Re'e, the first three are all mentioned in the same verse, whereas the pig is mentioned in a verse by itself. The message being that the first three exiles would be relatively short in comparison to the last exile, which would be longer than all three previous exiles combined. You know, one has to wonder, why is it that with all the unclean animals, the Torah mentions the clean sign before mentioning the unclean sign? So the Kliyakar answers that in human deception, there is always a danger where one pretends to be pure and righteous on the outside, where when in reality, uh, they are really devious and wicked on the inside. We may also ask, why does the Torah list the signs of kosher animals first, then with the birds? The Torah lists the names of the unclean birds and, and not the names of any of the clean birds. The Torah is an instruction manual for those who teach others. It shows us how to present information to our pupils in the most concise manner possible, always showing the smaller number because it's easier to remember. In addition, all the mitzvot in the Torah are dependent upon eating, since the first sin command committed 
by Adam, first man, was connected to the tree of knowledge. This was the only tree in the garden which God had forbidden Adam to eat from. And now, all the other mitzvahs that we are commanded to observe are, so to speak, an atonement, a correction, in one way or another for his sin. The Barbanel states that our spiritual Torah was given to us, pardon me, not given to us as a cure for our bodies or our concern for our health. It was given to us for well for our for the well being and spiritual elevation of our souls. We are therefore forbidden to eat that things that eat foods that contaminate our pure souls. On the other hand, the tour states that the consumption of animals that are suffering from a terminal disease or injury, though it is not specifically mentioned in the Torah as being forbidden under the same category, since eating from them does not convey any negative spiritual influences on our soul at all. Nonetheless, since they may still have a detrimental effect on our physical well-being of the person eating them, they are forbidden to be consumed. Now, during the 40 years the Jewish nation traveled in the desert, God Almighty gave the people natural water to drink. Again, Be'er Miriam, the well of Miriam. He could have just as easily given them natural food to eat. Instead, he chose to give them mun, spiritual food, which descended daily from heaven. This was done so that they would be able to reach greater levels of spirituality. As the saying goes, you are what you eat. The Tzor HaMa'or states that from those, these laws that apply to pure and impure animals, fowls, and fish, we see just how important what a Jew eats can be to their spiritual growth and perfection. In the portion of Shemini, the first verse in the chapter ends with the words, Lemor Lahem, saying to them, the Ramban states that the nation of Israel was com were commanded not to eat anything tome, spiritually defiled, since it cultivates cruelty in a person. A Jew who is part of the holy nation should only cultivate traits of chesed, of kindness. Rebbe Yitzchak of Bardichev states that in Yol, Benovu b'nei chem and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Now, in the future, all the children of Israel will speak directly with God Almighty. It would not be proper that a mouth that ate anything tome, defiled, should speak with the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. And so the word Alehem has all the letters of God's names of justice except for the letter Yud. The letter Yud is the letter that God used when he created the heavens above. So the verse can be read that in the future, Lamor Elohim, God will speak directly to them. In the portion of Shemini, it states, Zos hachaya asher tohu. These are the living things which you may eat. From the Hebrew word chaya, alive, the sages extrapolate. From here we are, only, we are only allowed to eat an animal that was healthy and capable of living before we slaughtered it. If an animal was terminal or injured with a wound that would be fatal, we are not allowed to eat its meat, even if it was slaughtered with the proper shechita. The animal is referred to as treif, again, which is translated as torn, based on the Talmud and the tractate of Chulam. The herb begins with these animals that are kosher. The same is true with fish and grasshoppers. The reason given is that, logically, it would be better for man not to eat anything that is alive. The Talmud and the tractate of Sochem states that an ignorant person is actually forbidden to eat meat. And so the Torah begins with animals that one may eat since allowing the consumption of meat at all is a chiddush, a novelty, based on a chasam shasofer. Based on the wording at the end of this verse, which states, Asher al ha'aretz, that are on the earth, the Medrash states, that this expression is intended to exclude animals that live in the water. In the next verse, Verse 3, the Torah tells us about the two signs that make an animal kosher, and they are split hoofs and chewing their cud. A split hoof symbol symbolically implies that if someone finds themselves living an animalistic existence, they can always find a path back that will allow them to return back to God. A closed hoof denotes a tendency to remain animalistic, with no hope of ever being able to return. The two signs that make an animal kosher, split hooves, and the chewing of their cud, 
allude to the two categories of mitzvot, those between man and man and those between man and God. The hooves are external, and they allude to those logical mitzvot that we are commanded to keep. Those commandments, and even an Esau, would also agree should be kept. These commands between man and God, which are alluded to by the chewing of the cud, are not, not always logical and therefore a contention for the world. In order for us as Jews to serve God properly, we must accept both sides of kashras. The external is not enough. Evil is not only brought out through one's mouth, one may also use their feet to join in those who are sinning. As Dovin King David stated in the first chapter of Tehillim in Psalms, who has not walked in the counsel of the wicked. The split in the hoof symbolizes that a person should never be completely attached to the physicality of this world. In everything that we do, we should attempt to allow the light of godliness to shine through. Now, why is it that a split hoof represents a clean animal? Now, earth represents physicality, the animal soul. The foot connects the body to the earth through action. So the split hoof limits the connection to earthly matters. The Talmud, the tractate in Soto, states that the split hoof represents our connection to spirituality, the left side, which pushes us away, and the right side, which draws us near. Now, the left side represents the concept of gvura, severity, and the right side represents the concept of chesed, kindness. If an individual were to follow only one of these paths, it would indicate that the person is following their nature. By connecting to both sides, they are demonstrating that they have elevated themselves above their nature, an indication that they are now truly serving God and not serving themselves. This is alluded to by the concept of what we call Rasa Vishuv, moving up and returning back. The split hoof allows the light of the soul to permeate onto the physicality of this world and elevate it based on Be'ir Chumash. The chewing of the cut is described by Rashi. It states, the animal brings up and spews its food from its stomach and then brings it up again into its mouth to crush and to grind it thin. On a spiritual level, this teaches us that a person should constantly review their actions to better ascertain whether their decisions were, were proper or not. Things change constantly, and so we should be learning constantly. One should not allow themselves to become dogmatic. This is also an allusion to our Torah knowledge. One must constantly review what they had previously learned. In fact, the Talmud states that one should review their studies 100 times. The Talmud also states that one should constantly review their previous acts of tshuva, of repentance. And just as our Torah knowledge increases, so too should our realization that our previous acts of tshuva may no longer be good enough today. We see this scenario described in the Torah with the story of the Viceroy, Yosef. At first he had incarcerated all the brothers, but then he reconsidered his decision and released all of them, except for Shimon. While the brothers were in prison, they too revisited their decision concerning the cell of Yosef. After reconsideration, they concluded, hmm, that they should have shown him more kindness. Now verses 4, 5, and 6 continue with three animals that chew their cud, but do not have split hooves. They are the camel, the rock badger, and the hare. Verse 7 mentions the pig, which is the only animal that has split hooves and does not chew its cud. The Torah specifies that these four animals to teach us that God, who knows all of his creations, says that it is only these four animals that have only one of the two signs that make an animal kosher. Now, when the Torah describes animals without split hooves in verses 4, 5, and 6, it uses all three tenses, present tense, future tense, and past. In verse 4, it states it does not have split hooves, present tense. In verse 5, it states it will not have split hooves, future tense. And in verse 6, it states its hooves were never split, past tense. So the Ma'inish Torah learns from here that when you want to refer to someone, a person as Tameh, spiritually defiled, one must take into account 
their past, their present, and their future. Not just the here and now. By doing so, one will be able to see all of our brethren in a positive light. One can see this fact as proof that the Torah was authored by God Almighty himself. No human being would be foolish enough to make such a statement, especially at a time in history when most of the world had not yet been explored. This fact was true in the year 2448 of creation, when the Torah was given to the Jewish nation at Mount Sinai. It is still true today, some 3,300 years later. Now, altogether, there are only 10 animals that have split hooves and chew their cud. Three are domesticated, cows, sheep, and goats. And seven are classified as animals that live in the wild, such as deer, bison, and even giraffes, amongst others. These correspond to the ten traits that God has taken upon himself when he created the world. Three of these traits are intellectual, and seven are emotional. Six of the emotional traits are masculine, and the seventh trait is feminine. So these numbers, six, one, and three, are an allusion to the 613 commandments that we as Jews are obligated to observe. Another feature that is found only in kosher animals is that their milk can be used to make butter or cheese, which is not the case with unclean animals. In addition, in all kosher animals, the carotid artery that supplies the brain with fresh blood is located in the neck, between the trachea and the esophagus. In non-kosher animals, this artery is found in the back of the spine. This fact is important since, according to Jewish law, the ritual slaughterer must cut the majority of both the trachea and the esophagus for the shechita to be valid. By doing so, they would automatically sever this carotid artery, carotid artery, pardon me. Serving this, severing this artery prevents the flow of blood to the brain. Without blood flowing to the brain, the animal can no longer feel any pain. And the knife used by the shokut must be surgically sharp. Even the slightest nick would invalidate the shechita, and the animal would not be kosher. Based on these facts, ritual slaughtering is therefore the most humane way to kill a kosher animal. From even a slight change in the vowel of a Hebrew word used in the description of these three animals that chew their cud but do not have split hooves, we learn something. When the Torah describes the camel and the rock badger, it uses the Hebrew word hu, which is masculine. However, with the hair, the Torah uses the same three letters, but the vowel changes the pronunciation to he, which is feminine. Nothing is an accident. So, so why did the Torah make this change? It would seem that this species has the same name for both male and female members. It is possible that the species has been named after the female, since it is the male, pardon me, female, who takes the initiative when mating with its male partner. In addition, the physical, the, the physical male organs normally found in all animals are hardly visible in the hare or the rabbit. Uh, there is really much more to be said about this topic, and so I think I will conclude this, my thought, on the topic of kosher at this time. God willing, next week, I will continue with the last of the non-kosher animals mentioned in the Torah, the pig. After that, I would like to continue my thought with a discussion of the application of kosher in relation to fish and birds. So let us hope that by observing the food that we put into our mouths, and also by being careful of the words that we allow to come out of our mouths, we can help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikano quickly and in our time. Again, I want to thank you very much for attending. God should bless you with all that is good. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe. Again, may God bless you and yours. Shabbat Shalom.